14 sites, 22 programs. We have about 750 beds that we're offering between emergency shelter and transitional housing as well as permanent housing. But we also have community uh, programs. We have an outreach program that uh, operates in, in three different locations. And we have drop-in center for the seriously mentally ill in the downtown east side. What we're trying to do is prevent homelessness. If they don't have to come to our shelters, we would prefer that. So the outreach team, what they are is a group of folks, and there's 14 of them now, are actually, they go out into the community to hotels, for instance, uh, where people, uh, landlords may be having difficulty with, uh, with their tenants, and they try and advocate for the person to be kept in the housing, and they provide extra support so they can keep their housing, and they deal with the issues that they're facing that may have brought on the crisis that would have put them at risk. They also outreach to the absolute homeless. You've seen the tent cities, you've seen um, people on the streets, in the parks, on the boulevards, and the freeway. It's mainly been Lookout's outreach team that's been going out uh, and talking to people, trying to encourage them to come into our shelters, or even better yet, into housing. They take them directly to the services that they need. I mean, if you can bypass the shelter, that's even best. People come in straight from the streets, they're referred from the hospitals, the police will bring them in, social services will send them, other agencies will, will send people. Wherever people are and there's no place else for them, that's what Lookout is about. You know, that's that safety net. Within months of actually opening, very few beds, um, they were full all the time with the same people. And one of the things that we discovered is that if you didn't deal with those issues, the fact that they had no income, then they were always going to be in your bed. They could never get a room of their own. We developed this thing about assessing people's needs and linking them to the service and the advocacy necessary to do that. And that's the core of Lookout's programs now, is when somebody comes into our shelters now, we are providing them with the support and all of the services that they need, You know, whether it's the, the basics of the, the food, the bed, the, uh, the showers, the clothing, the laundry, the telephone, all of those things. But not only that, I mean, it's assessing their needs, working with them to develop a case plan to, you know, what is it that got you into the situation? What is it that is going to resolve the situation for you? And then try and connect them with the services that will support them in whatever way it is or whatever their goals happen to be. So that's in a nutshell what's happening in the shelters. I just went into your office, mm -hmm. and I said, like, I just got to tell somebody what's going on here. Yeah. No, but the, most people, they don't get a chance to do that. No, they don't. And if you can tell somebody what's going on, then they can look at it. Because I can remember even you being logical about it and saying, okay, well, this has to get done and these forms have to get filled out and all that. It's, it, it's just not reasonable to expect a person who's trying to save their life to get involved in that kind of, like, logic. Fill in forms. Yeah. When we do an intake, we ask for a plan. People that are coming in to look out have mental health issues, uh, disability issues, addiction issues, or it can be a combination of issues. So a lot of it is stabilizing them first and getting them connected onto treatment, dealing with uh, physical health, mental health, emotional, all of that kind of stuff, finding the housing. The thing for me was I talked to someone and he said to me, you've got to solve your basic problem first. You know, you've got to get physically healthy and psychologically healthy. So you've got to deal with things in your life that are making you, you know, that are making you sick. Every few days we do a re review, see what they've been doing, whether they're looking for housing, who they've contacted. Some people need more than a short stay in a shelter. Some people stay in our shelters for um, 10 days, 12 days, 18 days. And some, unfortunately, stay in it for a lot longer because there isn't the housing resources. So we have transitional housing. Oh, I've been upstairs for, it'll be two years in July, and we've housed 55 people. And then we work on their nutrition, teach them how to cook, and teach them how money management. And they get a bank account while they're in here, and they get a bus pass, and they learn how to self-administer their medication. So when they go out, they've got all this stuff done, and they know how to manage their day-by-day -day life. They've got casual friendship through their, their wellness groups or whatever, so they can function. What we try to do is, is get them to uh, be able to live on their own. And if they really have a, a disability where they're not able to work, then we try to get them into volunteering three days a week or four days a week.
and I do the cleaning and she shovel the snow and I do gardening. The volunteering with UBC, you know, I think uh, I did two courses there last year. I did a writing course and I did a teaching course with them. And I have like really great people in my life. Leaving their apartment and going and doing something, we get them involved in churches if that's what they want to get involved in, or wellness groups. Uh, a lot of them have had issues with addictions, and so we you know hook them up with AA or NA or or just groups that meet together. We encourage them to go to the Coast Clubhouse, which is put on by the Vancouver Coast, and it's where you can go and there's movies and outings and and you can just go there for lunch. Or they have holidays, they go away for the weekend and stuff like that. We encourage them to reconnect with their families because a lot of them have broken off through all this. Because so, nothing's worse than having a mental illness and, and being locked into an apartment by yourself because then it just starts happening again. They feel comfortable with taking their medication and they're, they're quite functional. And they're able to go back and get post-secondary education or work or, or go into work programs. And, and, you know, we've gotten 10 people off the system completely that, have, that are in their, their own apartments. We've got you know, one young fellow that's a graphic engineer and lives in Yale Town right now. We have another fellow right now that's a manager of a restaurant, and he was in Riverview a year and a half ago. And once they start feeling good about themselves, away they go. You sleep in the doorways near Main and 18th, the grocery cart your home on wheels, filled with endless bags. They tell me you choose this life. I want to visit, but you prefer your aloneness. When I'm home in bed, warm, I think about you. In the morning, I see you with your cart, sheltering at the bus stop. Big lady, what's going to happen to you?